the Mogcast, a fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day. Well, Jacob, welcome to this first ever live broadcast of the Mogcast. We've done the broadcast in your office. We've done it in your home. We've done it in the august setting of the cabinet office, but this is the very first one, so welcome. And I thought I'd ask by uh, start by picking up where our proprietor left off and just ask you at the start about Jacob's Ladder, the book. Mm -hmm. Have you read it? I have, yes. I, I read it um, <laughs> to see what it had to say. It's fascinating. What an interesting life I led. I hadn't realised. <laughs> But am I allowed to plug my own book whilst we're plugging books? There is, of course, the Victorians available, appallingly reviewed by everybody other than Conservative Home, who were very kind about it. Uh, but then Conservative Thanks. Home is brilliant and full of geniuses, or genie if you prefer. Um, uh, and that's also available in some bookshop stores. I'm not quite sure how many anymore, but there are some. Perhaps second hand. That's very good. I mean, um, the Victorians did get some lively reviews, but nothing like some of the things that were said about my proprietor's biography, just to sort of give you a flavour. I mean, here's one account from the Daily Mail. I'm just simply going to read the, the headline, which said, the world's most unlikely sex symbol. New book <laughs> reveals how Jacob Rees-Mogg asked a chick lit author to marry him, ditched a girlfriend because she was a divorcee, then went an heiress with a silver tongue stunt. I mean, did you recognise your life? No, account. that didn't sound like me at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, reassuringly, Louise has confirmed that I did not uh, ever propose <laughs> to Louise, though she is indeed an old friend uh, and godmother to my um, eldest son. Very good. Um, I mean, now let's, um, let's sort of get properly down to, to business. Um, it seems to me that there are, there are two conservative conferences going on. There's the one we're experiencing, and there are the events my colleagues in the media are writing about, which in some cases are unrelated to the conference at all. So I want to try and get them out of the way first mm -hmm. and deal with this um, Charlotte Edwards allegation. Now, I'm going to presume it's untrue. You know, the Prime Minister has denied this sort of groping story. The question I wanted to try to get into was to try to explore why modern politics works like this. So. If it was true, would it really be a problem, this sort of incident in a I, senior politician? Look, I'm not going to bandy a lady's name, so I'm not going to talk about any specific no. cases on no. any pair of individuals. I think that would be quite wrong. But if you want to ask generic questions, generic questions. I will try and answer those. Yeah, and it's a generic question. I mean, does that sort of conduct in public life matter? Particularly if it, in an imaginary world, happened before the person was a member of parliament. Well, that was David Cameron's argument, wasn't it? That politicians were entitled to a private life before mm. they got into politics and that the standards that you apply to um, politicians are different from those you apply to non-politicians. I think the true answer is that these things are always a matter of power and the relationship of power between the individuals concerned uh, and that if it is an employer-employee relationship, that is um, improper because the employer uh, has the opportunity to pay bonuses, to increase salary, possibly even to fire the individual concerned. If it is um, two teenagers um, at school together, uh, it's in a different order of magnitude. <clears throat> and so you've got to be very careful about the specific circumstances. Uh, does that mean automatically on entering politics, you are senior enough in the general run of things uh, that you should never do this? Well, again, it depends on the power relationship and a number of MPs have got married to each other. Uh, and that seems to me a perfectly reasonable and respectable thing to do. And there is no uh, um, inequality of power between them. But there are questions that get raised when the person is a young intern uh, who is working for the Member of Parliament hoping for a political career. Uh, and the um, uh, uh, example um, of that happening is, is well known and um, led to an impeachment. 
Let's just take a step back from that for a moment and kind of ask why all this is happening. And I will put um, a point of view to you, which is that essentially we have a parliament that won't deliver Brexit here. We have a prime minister who wants to hear, and he really seems to me to be appealing above parliament to the voters. And it also seems to me that the Remain family, if that's the right phrase for them, is desperate to stop him. So anything uh, about his you know, alleged financial dealings, private life, all fair game, rappers hold up models of his head on stage. And this is the background to what's going on, is it not? Oh, on that, you're absolutely right. This was always going to be the case. There are now, what, 30 days before we leave the European Union. Just imagine, any of you in this room or listening, that you are, in fact, a Remainer. And that, that I know it's hard, isn't it? You're, you're <laughs> this is when those pictures get taken of um, uh, Conservative delegates at the conference, and it's said they're all so gloomy because they've just been told they've got to imagine that they are Remainers. Um, so just do it for a moment. You've got 30 days to hold on to the thing that you most love. It matters to you more than almost anything else. The fanaticism of Remainers is something Leavers, I think, have uh, underrated. I don't think we realised that after the referendum was concluded, they wouldn't accept the result uh, and believe in democracy and allow it to be implemented. Instead, they have fought a very strong rearguard action, and they have 30 days in which to complete that. They will throw any bit of mud at Boris Johnson they can find, that they are determined to destabilize the government. And we have a, a constitution that has been abused. Um, in the House of Commons, Standing Orders and Erskine May have come to stand for remarkably little. And in fact, what is happening is what the Speaker wakes up in the morning and thinks he would like to do. And that is deeply unsatisfactory because you need certainty, you need the power of convention to ensure that each MP and clerk knows how the processes within the House will operate. That is a sort of routine basis for legislature. And you've had the House of Lords behave, to my mind, even more disgracefully. If the House of Lords exists to do one thing, it is um, to allow people to think again, to take the immediate heat and passion out of issues, uh, and <clears throat> to check what is being done in the lower house. By agreeing to emergency legislation, it failed to do all of that. And by passing emergency legislation for which there was no consensus, the House of Lords has set itself directly against the British people who it holds in contempt. If you don't believe that, just listen to some of the debates. And I'm very glad to see Lord Ridley nodding at this because he is great. One of the brave souls in the House of Lords who raises the banner of Euroscepticism against the fanatics. Um, the debates they have in there treat the British people with the utmost disdain. And the Duke of Omnium could not have been more condescending to his lowliest tenant than the way most peers think uh, about us British people who voted to leave. So you've got the abuse of the Constitution to stop it. You've got allegations made against uh, the Prime Minister. Every bit of mud that can be thrown will be thrown. And stories that are gossip column stories get wound up. Fine. And if I put um, a view to you, which you've agreed with, let's just sort of go on and ask the question, have the Labour Party in any way got a point? So when the Prime Minister used this term, the surrender bill, and a Labour MP popped up and invoked Joe Cox, do you think Labour MPs are being sincere when they do that? Or is it a form of political gamesmanship? Well, you started by asking if I thought the Labour Party had a point, to which the question <laughs> answer is obvious. No, certainly not when led by Jeremy Corbyn. Oh, I, I think um, look, all individual MPs are sincere, but the sum of the parts is less than the, uh, is more than the whole. That, that, that there isn't sincerity in the Labour Party in this overall. It is purely political grandstanding, and it is absolute prize nonsense. Surrender bill does not lead to people being murdered. Saying a member of parliament should be lynched is much more likely to lead to people being murdered. The language of the hard left is appalling. Look at this Lammy fellow who called the... <coughs> <laughs> uh, who, he, I mean, I think he's worth laughing at, quite frankly, because he, he um, goes on about how language should be 
um, not stirring things up, except when he's calling people Nazis. When challenged on that, he says they're worse than Nazis. I mean, really, this is just such silly language coming from him. I don't think anybody bothers taking offense from it because it's simply too absurd for words. But the Labour Party complains about language because it's losing the argument. What do they really dislike? They dislike the fact that we say we believe in democracy. Well, it won't be long before they say democracy is such a rude and prejudicial word that it must be banned. They complain that our prime minister is practically a dictator. Why? Because he wants a general election. How many dictators in the whole of history have said, I am such a dictator, I will make you have a general election? I mean, it, la language ought always to be used wisely, and the prime minister is an expert user of language uh, and of using language that very often I haven't heard of, words that are completely <laughs> new to me most Monday mornings. The Oxford Dictionary was coming out. So what on earth does that word mean? Um, and I won't mention specific examples. Some of them turned out to be rude. Um, uh, so language is important, but saying surrender bill is not leading to political violence. And it is because they're losing the argument that they say that it is. You, you said at the start of that wonderful flight of oratory just now, in which you bash the Labour Party all over the place. You said, well, MPs are always sincere. There's an element of sincerity here you suggested about the original question from the original MP who put it to, to the PM. Was he right to say humbug? Um, um, Paul Sheriff is a very sincere person, but that doesn't mean that every statement that she makes is right or can't be attacked for being humbug. I think very highly of Jess Phillips. She is an unbelievably sincere, decent, good, worthy person. But Jess sometimes says things that I think are not um, the right way of approaching politics. And therefore, you are entitled to vigorous disagreement. You are entitled to say what somebody has just said is humbug, because that's how it appears to you. But looking into the person's inner nature, when Paula stood up and said that, was she in her mind being sincere? Yes, I think she was. Was what she said nonetheless humbug? Yes, I think it was. And I don't think it's inconsistent to hold those two positions. And I think it is important to respect the sincerity of the individual politician, even if one thinks the specific statement uh, is unsatisfactory. If you pan the camera back from all this, there's something bigger going on, isn't there, which is a big cultural push to shut parts of the right, indeed most of the right, down. Let me give you two examples. Um, one's the Toby Young example, you know, this guy who's uh, appointed as an advisor to the government, uh, and his opponents then indulge in what he described as journalistic archaeology, going back through his columns to the 1980s to find a reason to bar him from the job he was appointed to. Second recent example, which actually worked out better in the end, was the treatment of Roger Scruton, um, who's interviewed by someone from the New Statesman, quotes have made out, taken out of context and put on Twitter. There's a hue and cry, Scruton's forced out, and you know, it took a very, very long campaign to get him back in. So there's something very big going on here, isn't there? And how does the centre-right deal with this attempt to delegitimize it and shut it down? Well, we have to show backbone. We shouldn't have um, removed either of those people from the posts to which they had been appointed. That was a sign of weakness. And we have to stand up for free speech, which is under attack from the left. It's under attack in, in universities. Um, I went to speak at um, Bristol University, the Conservative Association. And because the previous event I'd done had had a little um, argument uh, with it, um, they'd made arrangements for security. The Conservative Association at Bristol then got a bill from the university authorities for over £500, which nearly bankrupted it. You can't have... I know I'm the visitor of Bristol University as Lord President of the Council. Not that this means I can even visit it, but I am nonetheless the visitor. Um, this is absolutely outrageous. <laughs> Universities must pr provide security to allow speakers to go. That is a cost of running the universities. It is not a cost for the association. It makes it impossible. Students cannot afford £500 for every visit. I was then invited by the Catholic Association of Bristol, which is easy for me to go to. It's very near home. And I said, well, look, I don't think I can come because you will get this huge bill. 
uh, from the university authorities if I come and speak to you. That closes down free speech in the place where free speech ought to be most upheld, because how do we generate new ideas if we don't have free speech in our universities? Perhaps they don't want to invent new ideas, perhaps they just want to sing socialist songs instead. But um, we must stand up for free speech, and therefore it's why it's so important we should all go out every morning when we get up and buy our newspaper, we should say, I don't like the surrender bill 50 times because we must not be bullied into avoiding perfectly reasonable language by the fake hysteria of the left. We have to be campaigners for free speech. We should never have gone along with Leveson, which was a real attack on free speech. And thank heavens, organizations like Conservative Home that are online uh, um, outside its scope, and therefore Leveson turned out to be completely ineffective. But nonetheless, conservatives went along with something which was basically a plot by the left to shut up newspapers that had been rude about them over the previous few decades. And therefore, we have to be campaigners for free speech the whole time, otherwise we lose by default. And don't apologize for using routine language. Is there any role for government here at all? I mean, let's take the case of Bristol University you've just cited. It's an independent institution. It's a university. It's behaving in this way, you say, and I'm sure you're, you're right. Effectively, it's impossible to organise the meeting to which you referred if you don't want to have a hefty bill. Is there anything that government can do, or is it just rather a case of trying to change the culture by continuously making the argument? Well, well universities are only independent up to agree because they're subsidised by the state. They receive huge amounts of money. Uh, and when you're giving people money, that gives you a certain standing to say, in return for this money, we expect you to defend free speech. Now, the difficulty with that is what happens if a socialist government gets in and says, for giving you this money, we expect you to crack down on free speech. So what I think you want um, is more independence for these organizations. Um, and you need something like the First Amendment to ensure that there is genuine freedom of speech. And we also need to look at the constitutional implications of a growing privacy law that nobody has voted for, which clamps down on freedom of speech. And it's a particular protection for the rich and powerful with all these injunctions and super injunctions uh, that are used to stop unpleasant stories getting out about people. And I think super injunctions are fundamentally uh, inimical to freedom of speech. Was the government unwise to attempt the prorogation in the way that it did? No, um, it was a routine prorogation. And I don't think there was any constitutionalist who thought that it was anything other than a routine prorogation until the Supreme Court ruled otherwise. I mean, you say it was a routine prorogation. That wasn't an argument in the end the Supreme Court accepted. Uh, and it's, it's not an argument a number of people who are by no means badly disposed to the Conservative Party accept. Even to me, it didn't quite look like a routine prorogation. It looked like a way of dealing with problems that had been caused essentially by the bias of the speaker. I mean, the, but the speaker has um, used to be a great defender of the speaker, who was much more critical of him a few moments ago. Well, the speaker has clearly bent the rules, and it seemed to a lot of observers that the prorogation was intended to not to stop the Commons questioning the government, but to give the Commons the least possible time to question the government. Um, we were due for a conference recess, which would have taken out three weeks. I mean, the time actually being lost was very, very small uh, and not unreasonable. Um, there were previous prorogations that were uh, one of three weeks not that long ago uh, because it coincided with a recess. So all of that was perfectly normal. And the um, Supreme Court had a certain confusion about how recesses worked. For example, it, it said that written questions receive answers during recesses and therefore the government can be held to account. Well, that's just wrong. That doesn't happen. Written answers don't get given. <clears throat> so it was just formalizing something uh, that had been agreed um, between the various whips that the Labour chief whip had nodded when I said we were going to have the um, uh, conference recess at uh, my first outing making a statement as leader of the House. Uh, we lost four or five days of business, potentially. It was entirely within the bounds of constitutionality. And, and the Supreme Court was very concerned about what happens if you um, prorogued for a year. Well, it, everyone had realized that you couldn't prorogue, and it wouldn't have been right to prorogue from the end of July to the 1st of November. 
there were articles saying why don't the government why doesn't the government do this the reason the government didn't even think about doing this is because it would have been unconstitutional because the government has a duty towards the constitution and there is parliament uh, to argue the toss if the government does something it doesn't like just suppose for him the government had done that imagine that it had prorogued parliament from all the way from july through to november do you think it would have been within the scope, within the proper role of the Supreme Court to pass a judgment on that? Um, I can't regrettably go into the judgments of the Supreme Court when the issue is so raw. We may be able to discuss it in future Conservative Home podcasts or modcasts, as they're flatteringly called. <laughs> regrettably suggests you really don't like the judgment very much. You might think that I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> <laughs> is there generally... Uh, a case for looking again um, at the way the judiciary work. Uh, we know the story. We have the law lords. Tony Blair abolished the law lords. He set up a Supreme Court. The very words Supreme Court have got an echo of America, where you have a formal separation of powers that we, we don't have here. Is it sustainable to carry on in the way we're carrying on uh, without either going back to a law lord system or having fully-fledged hearings for judges as they do in the United States? Well, what is the key thing about the old system? The key thing about the old system was that the Supreme Court was the Supreme Court of Parliament, and that everything came together in Parliament. Crown, executive, in brackets, legislature, and judiciary. The apex of our whole system was Parliament, and everything that happened was a parliamentary process. The House of Lords was the judicial committee of the House of Lords. It wasn't a separate body. If the um, House of Lords met during a parliamentary recess, it would meet in the chamber of the House of Lords because it was the House of Lords giving a final answer. Parliament was giving a final answer. And what the Labour government under Tony Blair didn't want was this system where the separation of powers was informal rather than explicit. So it decided to remove elements of the executive from the legislature, so the Lord Chancellor ceased to be Speaker of the House of Lords, and it took the judiciary out of Parliament altogether and gave it a separate structure. But it then didn't go further and work out how the relationships would then operate between the separated parts. So you had a totality within Parliament, and bits were sort of wrenched out without working out how that could operate. And we now have, with the developments by the Speaker of Standing Orders, um, the legislature against the executive, post-fixed term Parliament Act, this is made possible, that is again not within the spirit, the grain of our constitution. We have always had a system where if the legislature has no confidence in the executive, you have a general election. The US has always had a system where the two are set up to be in opposition, and therefore you have different channels, different methods to get agreement, compromise, to get things sorted out. And we have taken steps towards America without fully thinking through where we are going. Uh, let me poll Conservative Home readers. Who here would like uh, hearings for judges? Hands up if you would. And who is opposed? It's, it's, I'm, I'm going to do my best Labour um, conference <laughs> uh, thing. I think that was marginal majority in favour of judicial hearings, uh, with many abstentions, as far as I could tell. Uh, I think it would be a huge departure from our system. Uh, and if you look at the recent hearings for US justices, I'm not sure our judges would enjoy that. But you want to go back to a law lord system. That's the thrust of your answer, isn't it? I noticed that Conservative Home had a poll and that yeah, most yeah. Conservative Home readers were very keen on that. Uh, I think, I'm going to say again, I think this issue is too raw for me to start saying what sort of changes there should be. But the one thing I can say, as it was in the manifesto last time, is that we must abolish the Fixed Term Parliament Act, which is a dreadful act. And the, the reason I got a reputation for voting against the government was I voted against the government consistently on the Fixed Term Parliament Act. So I have been saying this for some time. Um, and uh, by long convention, constitutional matters were free votes, but that was not one that applied to the Fixed Term Parliament Act. So just on that uh, Conservative Home survey, which you've, you've picked up, I mean, I found looking at it that the most striking thing 
was that about 25% of the respondents thought there should be no change at all, despite this survey coming in the wake of the Supreme Court's judgment. And I just wondered if the reputation of the judiciary really is much more solidly established than some conservatives think, in the sense that monarchy, armed forces, politicians, let alone journalists, all these institutions have had a thrashing over the last 30 years in one way or another. But although individual judges often get pilloried... Well, not the monarchy. There's nobody who thinks the time, Gardner, at the, at the, the Queen well, is fantastic. At, at, at the time well, of the, the death... The at, 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 um, at the time of the death think, of Princess well, Diana. I, I think time this of is the treason. Death of, I mean, we're not allowed to say anything ever rude about the Queen. She's absolutely wonderful. We're so lucky to have her, and her reputation gets better every day and has done throughout her reign. If I could say and that... that is the, the line to take for all Conservatives. Yeah. But at the, time of the, at the time of the death... At the time of the death of Princess Diana... The monarchy had a wobble. I've never seen the judges institutionally have a wobble. The media go after individual judges, but no one's gone after the judiciary as a class, their expenses, their interests, what their family do, where their children go to school, and all the stuff that politicians get. Do you think we're any nearer that, or is there a great institutional respect for the judges that won't move? Oh, there is great institutional respect uh, for, for the judges. Um, and there has been in modern times. Um, uh, it would take a great deal for that to change. And I don't think individual judgments of this kind lead to it changing. I think what leads to it changing, actually, is when the judges give two weeks community service to somebody who's murdered 15 people, it's, it's, um, which they don't do. I mean, they, 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 well, but that causes much more concern in the public consciousness uh, than a constitutional ruling. Parliament, the word parliament, doesn't just mean the legislature, no. does it? No, of course it doesn't. Um, the, the, the Queen in Parliament is the basis of our system. How does Parliament evolve? That if you look at the early parliaments, what happens is that the King summons a parliament, the Lords sit nearest to him because they're his friends, his closest advisors, his family, um, you've got the clerics there as well who have high status because of who they are. And then you have the commons who are there um, uh, in an initially informal capacity. The commons then takes itself out of this and essentially becomes a committee of parliament. The House of Commons and the House of Lords, in a way, are committees of parliament. And the whole of parliament you see twice. You see the whole of parliament uh, at the Queen's speech when Parliament is opened, and you see at the prorogation when the whole of Parliament is once again oh. assembled. That is the envelope of Parliament. So, so we're agreed. Parliament doesn't just mean the legislature. It means the Queen in Parliament. It's a point where of course the Queen, does. her government, and the legislature meet. If that's true, how can prorogation possibly be something that's imposed on Parliament from the outside? Um, the Supreme Court said it, and uh, um, uh, they themselves said it, and they themselves were the Supreme Court, to misquote Cicero. Indeed. I'm just prodding you a little bit to see how you could possibly agree, even implicitly, with the view of the Supreme Court, when whatever its knowledge of law may be, its knowledge of what Parliament is seemed to be woefully short. Um, I refer the Honourable Gentleman to the answer I gave some moments ago. <laughs> All right, well, we'll move on from prorogation and the, and the Supreme Court. Um, under what circumstances, if any, should the whip be restored to the 21? Well, I always believe in politics in being as generous as you possibly can be, but you cannot have a situation where people are trying to put Jeremy Corbyn in charge of the order paper. So, look, if, if, if they are willing to show that they are willing to support a Conservative government, deliver a Conservative programme, and pull back from what they did before. I think generosity is in the nature of Conservatism, and the Conservative Party is a broad church and needs to uh, remain a broad church. Um, you may be shocked that I should say this, but the Mogcast does not have a monopoly on wisdom within the Conservative Party. <laughs> Sadly. We'll try, but not... Well, except when my sister does it. No, no, she's no longer in the Conservative Party, but you know what I mean. Um, uh, and, and therefore, we ought to be generous, uh, and we oughtn't to be um, ideological about who belongs to the Tory party. We need to welcome people who are willing to make interesting arguments, but we cannot have a situation where people hand over the order paper to the opposition. So 
How do you get on from here? Well, let's see if there are any other votes which give them the chance to uh, come back. I, I think a number of them are retiring and have no interest in coming back, so it won't be everybody. What would such votes be? What could they possibly do to make their way back? That part of the 21 who do want uh, to come back? I don't know is the honest answer. I just hope there will be something. Um, I think it would be a pity if very popular, well-liked Conservatives uh, left Parliament under the cloud of not having the Conservative whip and people who've done great service to, to the party. It is, a, it is a sadness that they're not in, but the decision was right. I, I, I don't think it was an error to take away the whip. Let me just come back to um, the person who, in my view, is the, the cause, the origin of much of the situation we're in now, which is the Speaker. And when we've done these modcasts in the past, you've been a great defender of the Speaker. I remember we've, um, we, we had a discussion where you said, well, actually, my only disagreement with what he's done, really, was his ruling on the use of the word forthwith. This would have been roughly a month ago. But I noticed at the start of this conversation, you were very exacting about him. I mean, do you share my view that essentially many of the parliamentary problems that the government's facing now are there because he's bust convention. And having bust convention, we are in the situation in which we're in. I'll explain my defence of the Speaker, which I still hold to. I think the Speaker has been a very important Speaker in allowing the Commons to do its job of holding the um, executive to account, which is the right job of the House of Commons. And I will give, as I've given at other Conservative events uh, at this conference, um, a specific example of my own as a backbench MP trying to get a very expensive drug for a child in my constituency for a very unpleasant disease, a disease called Batten disease. And um, the government wasn't making a decision was the problem. It wasn't saying yes and it wasn't saying no. And this left problem hanging over a number of parents whose children had this absolutely terrible, terrible disease. It is basically childhood dementia. So your child learns to walk and to talk and then unlearns those skills and life expectancy is short. The, the drug provides at least 30 years of good quality of life. It doesn't reverse, but it stops the deterioration, but it costs a very large amount of money. I don't know how much because neither the NHS government will uh, or the company will reveal the figure. Um, by going to the speaker, I was able to raise questions in health questions. That's pretty straightforward. I was able to get an adjournment debate and I was able to get an urgent question uh, because the government didn't give the statement that it had promised at the adjournment debate. I was able to use parliamentary procedures to put pressure on the government to do something that the government ought to have been doing anyway. This is straightforward redress of grievance and the Speaker was much, much better than some of his immediate predecessors in allowing backbench MPs to do this. And that's very important because it raises the status of the House of Commons and its ability to do its job. From about a year ago, he went much further than this. And instead of using procedures that were there and that were well known and pushing them to the edges, he invented entirely new procedures. And forthwith was the first of those. And that led to uncertainty within standing orders and to the process that was happening. He then facilitated two pieces of emergency legislation when there wasn't consensus and it seems to me emergency legislation must only take place when there is a consensus, because otherwise it can be used tyrannically. What is to stop an incoming government with a majority passing the whole of its manifesto in one day, in one omnibus bill, allowing two hours of debate? We now know that you can pass legislation that is disagreed with. You can do it by one vote. Bear in mind, the first emergency bill, the Cooper Bowles bill, got through by one vote to allow the time for this to happen. That doesn't allow the minority to have its say. It doesn't allow the processes to be gone, gone through. It removes the protections. That was fundamentally irresponsible. And then the area where I'm most critical, Mr. Speaker, is he started making statements outside the House of Commons. Mr. Speaker has no authority to say anything outside the House of Commons. He has no eyes to see with nor tongues to speak, except as directed by the House of Commons. That is a basic principle. So when he said, 
outside the Commons that he was opposed to prorogation. And then when he said on a lecture tour uh, that he was going to use every procedural trick he could to stop a no-deal Brexit, he had so busted the bounds of his role that I could no longer, out of deference to his position as Speaker, a position I think is important and respect and wish to uphold, or out of personal like for him, which I genuinely have, um, I felt I could no longer say polite niceties about him. I had to say what I thought the picture was. Why is he doing it? Oh, you'll have to ask him. You, you should have a Burko cast. Um, uh, 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 <coughs> I think it would be enormously popular. There are some fascinating. There are some things even Conservative Home won't do. <laughs> do that now. Um, Brexit um, and the situation as it approaches with the October Council and the November deadline and all that. Um, I just want to go round and look at um, an aspect of the politics that's fascinating to me, because it's a world I don't know very well, I want to know what you think about it, which is what's going on within the Labour Party? Um, Jeremy Corbyn seems, to most people who know him, to be an old-fashioned Eurosceptic at heart. He's never changed his mind on anything else. Iran, Libya, Hezbollah, Hamas, whatever. Why on earth should he have changed his mind about Brexit? But he's been slowly manoeuvred and pushed by the pro-Remain forces in the Labour Party, which are enormous, which are centred in London, which are very powerful in the area of London he sits in, with Keir Starmer and Emily Thornberry and even Diane Abbott now being on board for Remain. And he's got pushed and shoved into this sort of absurd policy. Yet, at the conference, he was able somehow to have organised on his behalf, or at least be helped by, a kind of fight back led by Len McCluskey and Momentum, where up to a point he put a stop to it. What's your reading of where Labour is on all this? Well, I think the Labour Party is in an incredibly difficult position. And because we are nice, kindly people, we should have some sympathy for them. Because the Labour Party has broadly the most Remain seats and the most Leave seats. It has the seats where 70% voted Remain and the seats where 70% voted Leave. And it has found it absolutely impossible to square that circle and to keep its voters together. And it, the logical leaps that they take in developing policy are wonderful. They will be essay questions at university in due course. And where, where are we with Labour Party policy? The Labour Party wants to win an election, but it won't vote for that election. Having won that election, it wants to go to the EU to renegotiate a treaty that will be better than the treaty that we have negotiated, which it will then put to the people and it will then vote against. So you've got an election that it won't vote for, that it wants to have, so it can win, so it can negotiate, so it can oppose it to negotiation, so it can stay in the European Union. And I managed to say that all in one breath. It is, it is, thank you. It is completely extraordinary. Just before everyone else comes in, I want to end in a way more or less where I started. I started by trying to look at what's going on, at the sort of big uh, push against Boris Johnson. And it's pretty clear to me the aim of the push is, you know, first of all, get rid of Dominic Cummings, number one, thereby depriving the government of its, its you know, um, main strategic advisor. Two, once you've got rid of Dominic Cummings, force Boris Johnson into signing an extension. Three, once he signed it, if he signed it, he'd be all washed up with nowhere to go. Now, you know, you will say that the third thing won't happen. Just an aspect of thinking forward. I did think at one point that if there were to be an extension under whatever prime minister, a general election would soon follow. Now seems to me the game of the opponents of Brexit, having got the extension, isn't to allow a general election. It's to campaign again for a second referendum. Mm. Tom Watson says this from the Labour side. Oliver Letwin has now come out in favour of a second referendum. This is what they're up to, isn't it? Oh, I think your analysis is, is very accurate. Um, I do think we should um, uh, treat Tom Watson with the greatest caution after uh, all he did about the Nick fantasist and his use of parliamentary procedure um, to make unfounded allegations against distinguished figures, um, some of them in uh, old age and frail health. Uh, and I think that's done such damage to his reputation, almost irrecoverable damage. And I'm afraid I don't think him, of him as a serious political figure. He has influence in the Labour Party as a machine politician. But I, I think he needs 
a period of um, confession and penance for what he did to some very distinguished figures. Uh, um, on your question, um, first of all, on Dominic Cummings. Dominic Cummings is brilliant, and we are very, very lucky to have him. He, he is um, so principled, far-sighted, and capable. Um, the Prime Minister will not um, uh, go for this scheme. So that part of it mm -hmm. uh, won't, won't, won't happen. Um, but is that their plan? Yes, of course it is. That, look, avoiding no-deal Brexit is not true. They don't care about deal or no deal. They want to stop Brexit. That is the aim, and they think they can do it by delay and a second referendum. That is why we must not allow them to have delay. And actually, I think they'd lose a second referendum. But isn't it outrageous that elected politicians want to avoid more than anything else a general election? Why do they want to avoid general election? Because they know the British people loathe their shenanigans, their prestidigitation, their ledger domain, and that... Um, it is our job to expose that, because when we get to an election, it will be very good for um, those politicians who do what they say. Isn't really one of the government's best hopes in this difficult situation? You know, one looks at it from the outside and thinks, hmm, well, Boris Johnson says he won't break the law, says he won't break his word. You know, how does that work? And if I ask you if the government has a plan to deliver Brexit by October 31st, without breaking the law, you will say yes, of course, they are bound to do that. Isn't the government's best hope in this difficult situation, a good hope anyway, that the Commons can't settle on an alternative Prime Minister? The Liberal Democrats don't want Corbyn. Hence this talk of some interim Prime Minister, Margaret Beckett, Ken Clark, Nick Bowles, for all I know, Jeremy Corbyn can't possibly... It would be great. He's a very nice man, <laughs> highly clever, an intellectual figure. And, and once he was there, once any of these people were there, if there was a second referendum debate going on, this would take months. Jeremy Corbyn's out while this new government forms itself and gets on with doing whatever it's doing. It's the end of his Labour Party um, aim and what he stands for. This is a huge problem for the opposition, isn't it? collectively. It's very interesting because if Jeremy Corbyn gives up the leadership of the Labour Party, the hard left have lo has lost its grip on the Labour Party and they won't get it back, I don't think. I think they'll find it really hard to um, get another Corbynista leader in. They, it, it, say they take Margaret Beckett or Harriet Harman or Keir Starmer as the leader, none of those would hand over with any rapidity uh, to a Corbyn figure. And bear in mind, nobody's ever yet been a caretaker prime minister. At whatever age they have received the seals of office, actually the seals of office technically are as First Lord of the Treasury, not as prime minister, but I thought you'd like to know that. Um, uh, um, uh, so Margaret Becky, or Ken Clark, if Ken Clark becomes prime minister, he'll love it. I mean, he'll be in heaven. Um, and he won't suddenly yeah, yeah. say, oh, well, I've done this for a few weeks. I'll, I'll no, hand over that's... to that nice Mr. Yeah. Corbyn. He's really not going to do that. Um, so you're right on that point on the hard left. And the uh, Liberal Democrats, one feels so sad for them, really, um, <laughs> because they're torn, aren't they? They desperately, desperately want to stop Brexit. They loathe Brexit because they like their elitist schemes for telling us all what to do, because they do know best. They are very, very good at knowing best, the Liberal Democrats, in all ways. Um, and yet they know that in um, 1924 and in 2010, going into coalition destroyed them, absolutely wiped them out. And here they are. They are up at 22% in the polls or thereabouts, depends which poll you look at. They are more popular than they've been for years. They have recovered from the last coalition and they've done so on being a Remain party. If they now go in with the Labour Party, that completely goes because people say, well, why not have the Labour Party? Because that's the real deal. And the Labour Party wants to stop Brexit too. So the Lib Dems are kaput if they go into, um, to use a continental term, um, uh, if they go into coalition with the Labour Party. So the, the decisions that they face is how much do they hate Brexit against how much do they like their own survival, either as a political splinter group in terms of Corbyn or as a major political party in terms of the Lib Dems. So it's a happy dilemma for them. Just last on other political parties. Packed with the Brexit party? Um, I 
as you know, think highly of the Brexit party. I think Nigel Farage is a very capable, important political figure who has had an enormous influence. It's very hard to think of anybody outside the House of Commons who has had more influence on modern British politics. And they have the most brilliant MEP in history, um, who represents the East Midlands, uh, and with whom I happen to share a surname. Um, I, I, I'm completely, I was impartial as Mr. Speaker in this regard. Um, so I, I don't have any hostility towards the Brexit party. The difficulty with a pact is that if we have left on the 31st of October, what does the Brexit party exist to do? We've done its job. If, on the other hand, we haven't left by the 31st of October, the Brexit party won't do a pact with us. So I think it's one of those things, it's interesting in theory, but I don't see how you get to the practicality of having a pact. Let's have some questions. Who wants to, I'm going to take two, two at a time. So I'll take the lady there and the gentleman there. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you very much. This was very interesting. Uh, talk. Um, so I would, my question is that in the worst case scenario of, say, we're not able to leave with a deal on the 31st, not able to leave without a deal and also no general election by the 31st, do you think the government would ever countenance having another form of public vote, say, you know, with the question of leaving with whatever is the most recent deal or leaving with no deal? Because it strikes me that one of the reasons why opposition parties and remainers in parliament are able to consistently frustrate Brexit is because they can make claims that, oh, there's no public support for no deal, no public support for this type of Brexit, that type of Brexit, even though there's actually no formal evidence for that. And they're able to do that in a way that they weren't able to, say, refuse to trigger Article 50. We're going to take two questions. Is that right? Yes, the other one was from the gentleman there. Hi. Um, so I vote for Brexit, um, in favour of Brexit, and I think we should leave the 31st of October. I've got family in Belfast, and I recently visited, saw the history of the Troubles in the past as well. What they're anxious about, what, them, what I realise is that whatever happens, they're worried that if we leave with no deal about the troubles in the past, um, and I think they just want to, the government to get on with it. I mean, if we left with no deal, um, could there be some guarantee that there'd still be peace in Northern Ireland? There wouldn't be, you know, something like in the past where there were bombs going off everywhere and there were troubles and divisions as well. Um, that's what I want to say. Yeah. Thank you. Um, dealing with the question of could the Conservatives come forward with another vote of some kind, I think the answer is no, because the principle that you must implement the first vote before having a second vote is very strong. And the issue around the question is very difficult. How do you get a question that people will accept? We've had the in-out vote. If you were to say deal or no deal vote, then the other side say, well, actually, we think your deal's so bad that we've come to the conclusion we want to remain. Shouldn't we have a three-way vote? Likewise, um, if the Labour Party's suggestion is that they have a deal or a main vote, those of us who don't like the deal that Labour would come up with would want a, a no deal vote. And once you get onto a three-way vote, do you decide it on the largest number? Is there a transferable vote? I think it's very, very difficult to settle this any other way than a general election and a government with a majority that implements the referendum we've already had. I don't think there's a place for a further referendum, even one under our control. On Northern Ireland, the, the key here, the key change here, is that this government has said that there will be no checks on the border, but there will be checks. And that seems to me the really sensible place to be, because there are already checks which don't upset the peace process. And you can see on um, YouTube pictures of the Irish police stopping people, or the Irish customs stopping people to see if they're using the wrong type of diesel. I think it's green diesel for agricultural vehicles in the Republic and red in Northern Ireland. Red in the United Kingdom, green in, 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 in the Republic. Um, and to see that the right duties are paid. And that all goes on currently. And that would continue to go on, but it would cover a few extra areas. I don't think that is a threat to peace. I think the idea of putting up lots of border posts uh, would be potentially a magnet for disorder and is one of the reasons nobody wants to do that. So I'm absolutely confident that Brexit in and of itself makes no difference to the peace process. However, we really do need to get um, Stormont back up and running because that is the best way of bringing the two communities together and ensuring that there is good governance uh, in Northern Ireland. Take two more. Let's get over. Gentleman with a beard and yeah, the lady there. 
Uh, my question is, what guarantee do we have post-Brexit, which I'm absolutely certain Boris will get us, um, that our armed forces will be freed to work purely under NATO and have no control by the EU? Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. rees -Mogg, going back to the Supreme Court ruling, the case that was brought forward by Gina Miller was fundamentally a political case that was going to be very difficult for the judges to rule purely based on the legality of it. There was always going to be a political element to the ruling. So do you feel that if cases of a similar nature are brought to, to the justices, it could potentially lead to the politicization of the judiciary? Thank you. Um, okay, well, thank you. I'm afraid I'm going to duck the second question because I feel I've got to be very careful about what I say in relation to the uh, recent judgment and that if I'm drawn on that, I may appear to say things about it that I um, probably uh, shouldn't. And the, the first question, could you brief remind of what it, it was? Oh, yeah, oh, the armed forces, yes, absolutely. Once we've left the European Union... UK law is the only law that matters. We can't be told that we have got to do things. So once we've left, we can cooperate with European forces, but we can't be told that we must. And that is, I think, the key difference. It comes back under sovereign control. Gentleman there, and yeah, the lady here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Jacob, does um, EU law and Article 50 supersede the Ben Act? Um, yes, it does. I mean, it's just very straightforward. Um, thank you for taking my question. Um, one of the things that seems to be um, going on, especially with parliamentary debates at the moment, which I think is one of the most pernicious things to actually come out of this whole crisis, is that um, particularly Labour MPs, Lib Dems and Remainers seem to be using the line of unconstitutional to attempt to subvert anything they don't like. This, as you've seen with the Fixed Term Parliament Act, I think this could have real long-term consequences to our constitution, and I actually think it's quite insulting to our democracy and needs to stop. What's your view on this, and how do you think it can be solved? Thank you. I will elaborate a bit on the um, EU law. Um, <laughs> you, you may remember how we got the extension from the 29th of March. We did not get it by an act of the UK Parliament. We got it because as long as the 1972 European Communities Act is in force, EU law is more powerful than UK law. So anything is agreed at the EU level is our fundamental law overriding any domestic legislation. So Article 50, in EU law overrides the Ben Act. And if Dominic Grieve were here, he would say the same thing that it cannot force the European Union to offer, to accept an extension. On the issue of the constitutional questions, um, the constitutional yahoos are the other side. They're the ones who have broken down the most important conventions in the House of Lords, which do make you wonder what the House of Lords is supposed to be doing if it doesn't follow those conventions. They are the ones who have encouraged um, emergency legislation when there isn't an emergency and fail to have a consensus for it. We should be, as we always have been as a party, the defenders of the Constitution. And there's a great line from Dicey, who says that constitutional convention is there to ensure that Parliament and the Cabinet does what the nation wants. And unfortunately, Parliament has come to the conclusion that it is there to do what it wants. And this is a fundamental constitutional error and this isn't a novelty to say that sovereignty comes from the people to Parliament. It is of great antiquity and is the correct understanding of what Parliament is supposed to do. We have two more. We have, well, we have Lord Ridley and the gentleman in the hat. Uh, given what you said about the difficulty of uh, the opposition parties getting behind a caretaker prime minister, can you talk through just what will happen at the end of the 14-day period after Boris loses a vote of confidence, if that happens? I, uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, I was just wondering, how is it that as a society we've got to the point where students and teachers alike can come out and support socialism and communism and no one is completely bothered by that? But at the moment someone comes out as a conservative, everyone seems to completely lose their minds over this. So. How do you think we've managed to get to that point? 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, if there were to be a vote of no confidence and the government were to lose it, then the Fixed Term Parliament Act sets out a motion that may be put within 14 days to say that this House has confidence in Her Majesty's government. So there's no confidence and then there's confidence. If the second motion isn't passed, then you go to a general election for which the Prime Minister would set the date, and that would be Boris Johnson, because if there were no confidence, you wouldn't have established uh, an, a new Prime Minister. Now, here it's quite interesting because there is an evolution in our constitutional conventions that in the 19th century, uh, if a Prime Minister resigned, Queen Victoria would ask, and, and prior centuries, would ask somebody to see if he could form an administration. And that person would not at that point be prime minister. That person would then come back and say, yes, I can form an administration. But in that interim, the post would effectively be vacant. There is now an evolving constitutional theory that the post of prime minister must never be vacant. And so what I don't know, whether the queen would appoint somebody else to see if that person could get confidence, or whether the appointment would wait upon the confidence in the more antique constitutional convention. Obviously, I would prefer the latter, um, but I'm not sure which would happen. On students and free speech, um, we must stand up for free speech. We must help students who want to admit uh, to being conservative. And it's absolutely wonderful to see so many young people at the Conservative Party conference uh, this week. It's very encouraging when I go and speak at universities and at schools, um, how many conservatives there are and how many people are interested in conservative ideas. But the left is better at getting around and talking to students and making left-wingery seem appealing. We need to go around making right-wingery appealing. And there seems to me one crucial argument, and that is to say that we believe that people should take charge of their own lives, be free to make their own decisions, and Jeremy Corbyn thinks their lives should be run from Whitehall. And that if you say that to most 17 and 18 year olds, just beginning to free themselves of parental and um, schoolmasterly control. They should quite like the idea that they should run their own lives and that society is built from the bottom up rather than the collective ordering them about. We just need to get that message across. Last two, I think, and then that's it. So just the gentleman at the back and, yeah, okay, over there. Morning. Uh, thank you, Jacob, for the talk. Um, it's quite rare for someone to go from being a backbencher straight into the cabinet. It's quite rare nowadays. I was wondering how you found the transition and whether you learned anything or anything surprised you. <laughs> um, oh, well, th th thank you. Um, uh, oh, we've got to get the second question. Sorry, I was yes. about to answer okay. before we get the second question. Good morning, Jacob. Is there an appetite from Boris and or the government uh, to exploit legal loopholes in the Ben Surrender Act? Um, thank you. Um, and thank you for the question about um, my appointment. Um, uh, I, 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 I don't know how rare it is, except obviously it's quite common from opposition. It's, it, this is rare within government um, to go straight into the cabinet. It's absolutely fascinating. It is... Um, <laughs> different from being a backbencher, that uh, suddenly things that you discuss may actually happen rather than being completely theoretical, which is nice uh, and important. I am, I've gone native in terms of the civil servants, that, that I am incredibly impressed by the team I have working around me, uh, not least in the hours they work. And not one of them has said, it's five o'clock, I'm off. They're, you know, um, my private secretary was there at 11 o'clock at night when I was appointed to brief me for leaders' questions the next morning. And I got in the next morning for the continuation of the briefing at 7.15, and she'd been there since 7. I have a two-minute commute home. She has a much longer journey home. And the, the work ethic is really impressive. And the feeling that I don't know any of their political views, but that they are on my side, they are on the government side, they are there to help me do what the government wants to do. And the rigour, and my special advisor Beatrice was here, so I was here, 
Uh, the rigor with which they say, well, I can't tell you that, that's political. And then Beatrice has to chip in and say, well, why don't you say Jeremy Corbyn's got smelly socks or whatever um, it is she tells me to say. Uh, and then that's, then that's fine. It carries on. They'll go back to the non-political stuff. And I don't think he does, for the record. I, I think they're, <laughs> they're freshly laundered regularly. Uh, uh, um, uh, but but um, it's, it's really impressive how, how that element of the system works. Um, and it's interesting being on the, on the inside. And then on the question of legal loopholes... Um, People have been coming up with weird, wonderful, fantastical uh, loopholes that there may be. So it says the letter has to be sent, so it will be sent by pigeon post. Yes, we, were, we, we you, you did we, that, we didn't did you? That, yes. Yeah, um, all, all sorts of genius ideas. Ultimately, yeah. the law is not concerned with trifles. Um, it prefers bread and butter pudding. No, sorry, that was um, <laughs> that was bad, even by my standards. Um, you, you, you are charitable to laugh. Um, uh, the law is not concerned with trifles, and therefore I don't think any of those will work or are realistic. <laughs> the law is the law as it is. There is the very important question of how it interacts with EU law, um, but there is no easy and obvious loophole that I can sit here and tell you we can use, because if there is, I haven't spotted it. Thank you. Just a, a last question in preparation for when we come back next year, I hope, do the same thing all over again. We will have left the EU by then, won't we? We will have left the European Union on the 31st of October in the year of our Lord, 2019. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Mogcast, a fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day.